Good morning, everybody. Uh, I am <laughs> one, I'm a little cramped where I'm at right now, uh, but I think I can make this work. Anyway, um, I am currently reading Charles Darwin's 1859 book on the origin of species, and I'm reading it from this Britannica Great Books series. And f after every <laughs> after every chapter, I'm uh, responding with my own video, just giving my initial thoughts, maybe a few ideas, uh, just kind of mush-mouthing my way through this thing. But anyway, today I'm on chapters 12 and 13. I'm going to go ahead and do two chapters in this video because really it's the same chapter. Uh, it's lengthy and Darwin has broken it up into two chapters in his book. Uh, so I'm just going to go and do the whole thing and discuss his special topic of geographical distribution. Uh, really, what Darwin has done in this book, he's laid out his theory of natural selection, uh, this bombshell idea that proposes that all of life is quite literally related to each other in a literal sense um, by means of this mechanism of natural selection. He's laid that out way back in chapter four. And since that time, uh, Darwin has brought up a lot of special topics hybridism, for instance, a few other things. And he has uh, responded to a lot of objections from his critics and his, uh, his colleagues, things like that. And in this chapter where he discusses geological distribution, it's kind of a mix. Darwin is really responding to two fronts when he's, when he's approaching his critics. The first uh, front is really, you know, what we would term creationist. It's, it's the person who, for religious reasons, believes that individual species, or at least genera, or what creationists of today call kinds, uh, whatever, regardless, these groupings of, of creatures are products of special, unique creations. That there is no literal relation between uh, these species and I'll use species in a general term. There's no unique, um, th they are unique creations. And there's a lot of objections uh, based on that. I'll get to that in this chapter. The other front really is uh, what we today call Lamarckianism, or the idea, as it was understood uh, before Darwin's time, the idea of life evolving by changing uh, from its surroundings. It's, it's more of a natural method of breeding. We are breeding animals and plants to meet a specific end. And the thought was that nature did this also. And the impression that I get from reading Darwin is that this idea had roots back to alchemy, these alchemical uh, pro ideas of transmutation of forms was, was thought to be very similar in, in breeding and in nature. Uh, so we have that front also that Darwin is, is, is rejecting uh, or responding to. So with that said, we get to this lengthy chapter called Geographical Distribution, where uh, Darwin brings up these puzzling ideas of species forming on separate islands. And I mean islands in a literal sense and islands kind of in a, in a figurative sense, meaning isolated locations between which a species cannot uh, um, uh, migrate. So we're talking about literal islands where you have species of animals that seem to have been planted there, but they have, for instance, no means of getting from one island to another. So how did these species get there in the first place? Uh, and then we have metaphorical islands, and we're talking about things like mountain ranges. Why is it that on the tops of mountain ranges, you find similar species of plants and animals, but down in the valley between these mountain ranges, there's no way to get, <laughs> there's no way for these mountain creatures to pass, uh, but you can find them on these, on these mountain ranges. And because of this, because of this, a lot of people were proposing the idea of not only special creation of species, 
but special creations of the same species at many different locations. For instance, God would create, let's say, a mountain goat, but he created at the top of each mountain range individually, uh, which is uh, something I had never heard of in terms of a, a theological thought. I did not know that that was a thing, but Darwin brings it up again and again in this chapter. So it must have been a very prevalent idea back in, back in the time of Darwin. I'd never heard of it, but, so I find that kind of interesting. So Darwin talks about, let's say, the oceans. Now, in, in large form, between continents, let's say, or between oceans, you do find unique species in, in these large forms, you know, the, in individual oceans, for instance. Darwin talks about on either side of the isthmus of Panama, you find very unique creatures on each side. But where you do find similarities in creatures are on really islands. And I use that, I, again, I use the term islands in a general sense. So how is it then that, uh, let's say, certain types of plants can be found on many unique islands throughout, let's say, the Pacific. How do these plants transfer from one island to another? And then that, and then from here, Darwin branches off and, and discusses many of the observations and, exper and experiments that he is performing. So, for instance, well, we have seeds that can um, that can be blown across the ocean through typhoons or seeds that can wedge their way into logs, or birds that eat these seeds and then they die, dry up, and so the seeds float across the ocean in that way. And then Darwin discusses doing experiments with seeds, uh, immersing them in salt water or sea water in aquariums and seeing if they can survive any length of time. Um, he talks about can seeds survive the digestive system of a bird? Because a bird can fly across the ocean, land on a on an island, and poop out seeds, and you know you can transfer them that way, for instance, things like that. So a lot of these chapters is discussing mechanisms by which species of plants and animals can go from one island to another. Because this is the objection that Darwin is really facing in this chapter. This objection of multiple unique creations on these, on these islands. Darwin also talks about islands in the sense of mountain ranges. So how, for instance, do, do similar alpine plants and animals find their ways onto uh, different mountain ranges without having to migrate between those mountain ranges because migration let's say through a desert, <laughs> would be fatal to a mountain goat, <laughs> for instance. <laughs> how, how do they do this? So the mechanism Darwin proposes in this case is glaciation. So for instance, glaciers, uh, well, Darwin discusses a lot of evidence that must have been new at the time, uh, thanks to um, uh, recent books in geology that discuss that England, and the northern regions of, of North America and Europe were very recently covered in glaciers. So, hey, animals can traverse over those glaciers, find their way on mountaintops that way, glaciers recede, and there you go. You have the migration of animals in that way. All of this assumes that the earth is not static. The earth changes, it changes climate, it changes form. One interesting passage in here is that Darwin says that there's no reason to believe that continents don't change. Um, it must be receding of glaciers or the uplift of mountains, things like that. But we, we, we don't suppose that, that continents themselves change. I think Darwin would be amazed at what has been discovered, I believe, in the 1920s, and that's continental drift, that the Earth is much more fluid than even he imagined. Uh, and I think that would have answered a lot of his questions regarding the shifting and the moving of continents, uh, 
uh, like plates floating on the water. Uh, he, he would have been fascinated by that, I tell you. Um, one thing that I think Darwin really struggles with, and something that I have thought of many times, again, I'm from the desert, and I've hiked the desert hills really all my life. And in the desert, when you go up into the desert mountain ranges, you find um, temporary streams. And it's really just runoff off of these mountains into the desert floor. But when these desert streams do run with water, yeah, you can find fish, you can find frogs in them, you can find all of these animals in separate streams. So how to fish, I, I've thought this for many years and I still really don't know the answer to this. How is it that fish or aquatic animals, uh, fish and amphibians, how can they go from one watershed to the next? How can you find, for instance, similar trout in different watersheds? Here's what I mean. For instance, the Rio Grande watershed that flows into the Rio Grande River ultimately flows into the Gulf of Mexico near Brownsville, Texas. But you have a, a watershed, let's say, in the Mississippi River. That ne The water from the Mississippi River watershed is enormous. It also flows into the Gulf of Mexico. But the fresh water from each of those two watersheds, the Mississippi and the Rio Grande, never touch each other. They're unique watersheds. They're separated by land you know, and the salt water of the Gulf of Mexico. How is it then that fish, freshwater fish, can be similar in both? Well, Darwin says, one, that's a, in many cases, that's a misnomer because you do find many different types of animals in these two watersheds. But with that said, let's discuss the similarities. How do fish transfer between one watershed and the next? Or in the case of my desert environment, how do they, you know, we have unique watersheds here too, uh, but on a much smaller level. How, do, how are fish transferred, let's say, to isolated lakes? Uh, how does this happen? So Darwin here discusses um, some experiments he has done, <laughs> let's say, with ducks. Yeah, you can get some ducks, and he's, he's, <laughs> he's done these experiments where he's put ducks in his, in his aquarium to see if, if, uh, if mud will attach to their feet. Mud containing eggs, containing shells, containing other kinds of life, and waterfowl can transfer these, these, uh, you know, these embryos, this embryotic life in that way. And I, I laugh because I just picture Darwin conducting experiments with ducks kind of dipping their feet in the aquarium. The way he describes it, I thought was kind of funny. <laughs> Anyway, uh, so Darwin talks about, again, the uplift of mountains and how what once was common water, what once used to touch, is now separated. Watersheds are separated by the uplift of mountains or the uplift of land, things like that. Basically, what it boils down to in all of these cases is that the earth is fluid. Uh, the earth changes, not only species, not only life changes through means of, of natural selection, but the earth changes. The earth is fluid. The earth is dynamic. And I think it's more dynamic than Darwin even realized. Darwin talks about things like changing climate, the uh, changing eccentricity of the earth's orbit. He discusses that, which I kind of think he was wrong about. Uh, nonetheless, he throws that out as an idea. He discusses possibly the change of the tilt of the earth, very slightly uh, changing the climate. Uh, strikingly, he did not discuss the fluctuations of the sun. He does talk about climactic cycles in roughly 15 degree cycles, which today we understand primarily to be the cause of fluctuations in the sun. Um, so. Really, in these chapters, the bottom line is Darwin throws out the idea that species are distributed geographically in a puzzling way, but that's because of the dynamic earth, the oceans stirring, the continents rising and falling, things like that. So 
that's basically it for these two chapters, geographical distribution. Um, and those are a few ideas I have on that. Uh, next chapter, chapter 14, Mutual Affinities of Organic Beings. Morphology, Embryology, and Rudimentary Organs. My goodness, what are we getting to here? I think I have an idea what this may be about, uh, but I have to read it first and I'll get back to you then. So thank you for watching. And if you have anything, any response, video response, you want to read along, leave something in the comment, believe me, I'm super interested in anything that anybody out there has to say. Again, thank you for watching and take care.